Welcome to this episode of Moments in Leadership. Before I get into my interview with SIAC Ramon Colon Lopez, I just want to take a moment to thank everybody for all the encouragement and introductions, the sharing on social media, the reviews, the tips, the suggestions. It just means a lot to me. This is a personal project to just help find a medium that allows people to memorialize the leadership experiences that they had and pass them on to younger generations. And the project is really taking off, and I just want to say thanks to everybody that's been encouraging me along the way. If you're not already doing so, if you could give me a follow over on Instagram at The Mill Office, that's really where I'm doing most of my posting and talking about the show. It copies over to Facebook, but I really am not there all that much. That's a great place to follow me. If you don't mind, it would be a huge help if you could go into whatever player you're listening to this podcast on and just give it a nice review and you know leave some stars, preferably five, and, and a nice review. It, it just helps it look current and everything in the players. So without any further delay... Let me now introduce Siak Ramon Colon Lopez, who is the Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley. And this is a real honor to have him on today. He is the Senior Enlisted Service Member in the entire DOD. And I wouldn't have been able to get this interview if it wasn't for the generosity of a few of my friends making the introduction. And this is an interview that I've been really looking forward to, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Siak Ramon Colon Lopez, welcome to the Moments in Leadership podcast. As you know, this is my my passion project, and my intent here is to create a medium for career leaders to share their personal stories and observations, and as we call it in the Naval Service, our sea stories, so that younger leaders, both military and civilian, can consider them as they develop their own leadership style. So thank you so much for being willing to share your personal stories and your moments in leadership. And thank you for having me, sir. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here with you today. Great. I just want to start off real quick by asking you about your call sign, CZ, which stands out to me because I would have assumed that following convention, it may have been LZ. Is there a quick story there? No quick story, really. The, so my last name is really classified as Colon hyphen Lopez. So first, the last letter of the last name. And uh, the reason we do that is uh, brevity codes when we are at the X, at the objective, and also for aircrew manifest to know the positions of uh, each person in that particular rank and file. Great. Yeah, it's always interesting to hear about somebody's call sign background. So let's start with an explanation of your rank to listeners. At, at first glance, the rank on your uniform could be mistaken for that of a command chief master sergeant in the Air Force, but that's not actually your rank. So give listeners a quick orientation of the rank SEAC. Absolutely. So in December of 2019, General Mark A. Milley created the rank of SEAC. And now regardless of which service the SEAC comes from, there will no longer be a sergeant major, command sergeant major, command chief master sergeant, master chief petty officer. Their rank actually changes to SEAC. So your ID card, instead of chief master sergeant, in my case, being an airman, will say SEAC. And then, you know, the designator also for the position is senior enlisted advisor to the chairman. So the proper term of, of address is SEAC, not chief. The duty title is exactly the same. That's interesting because I, I know a lot of people when I was telling them I was interviewing you, they, they didn't understand that at all. So great quick learning point on the actual rank. So it's it's SIAC Cologne Lopez. The other thing about the rank is that it is the only joint rank in the entire Department of Defense. Oh, because really? Because regardless of service, whoever fills the position next, the rank will change to SIAC. Okay. Now, somebody can make the argument, well, what about captain? What about general? No, because you have generals and you have admirals, you know, and uh, then, you know, you have captains and you have lieutenant commanders. I mean, so so there's a little bit of a dichotomy there in a couple of uh, naval service specifically to where those ranks actually change. But regardless of who the person is and what service they come from the rank will change to CX. So it's the only joint uh, rank in the entire department. Right. And the actual insignia that you wear on your uniforms changes as well, correct? It's it's similar, but there's some there's some differences inside. The, yeah, so, so the differences are the Department of Defense War Eagle, who has no laurel leaves, and it's, uh, the eagle's head is pointing towards uh, the tip of the arrows. And then the four stars, which signifies the position seniority in the enlisted rank structure. That's interesting. Thanks for thanks for sharing that uh, and educating everybody on that. Interestingly, um, 
Peter Pace, who was the, I believe to be the first joint chief that, that had a SEAC. If I'm, if I'm incorrect about that, correct me, but he was once quoted as saying, look at the leaders you admire and emulate their best qualities. What do you think are some of the best qualities you have observed in leaders over your career that you yourself have emulated? Well, you know, it's, it's been 30 years and I have gotten to see quite a bit of, uh, of differences in the approach to leadership. But I believe that some of the qualities that stuck with me in, uh, in my journey as, a, as an airman, a warrior and a leader have been humility, discipline and compassion. And the reason I say those three is because when you put those three together, really, it just enforces your ability to employ courage to do what is right. And I stay in touch with General Pace. I spoke to him here not long ago doing a podcast of my own with him. And, you know, his, his words of looking at the leaders you admire and emulate their best qualities, you know, is something, a maxim that I have used in the past that I, uh, that I call, if you're going to fly with the eagles, don't hang around with the turkeys. Right. You know, it's just one of those things to where I've always tried to find people whom I admire that I really want to emulate those qualities. You mentioned your podcast. I was going to mention it towards the end, but you do have your own podcast. Do you want to just tell the listeners what it is and where they can find it? Yeah. So the, the podcast is called Bottom Line Up Front with the SEAC. And the the main purpose for that podcast is just to put out facts out there and just to go ahead and quell the misinformation campaign that is often plaguing the minds of our uh, of our troops. And it is an opportunity for us to have candid conversations with uh, prominent people in specific fields. And we're going to continue to do that here during the duration of my uh, of my assignment of my duty as a SEAC. I think that's great. I want to talk more about information operations and disinformation campaign a little bit later in the in the podcast. Yeah, I agree. It's just such an effective medium to communicate with people, which is why I chose it for my project as well. Taken from that question about the qualities that you emulated over your career, I want to jump back to your very early days because 100% of us start out in the military as either an E1 or an O1. But only 1% make it to that 30 or 40 year mark leader, you know, force level enlisted general officer. Tell me and tell us some stories that you remember from your first five years in your career that when you look back on them, that they, those crystallizing moments, those aha moments that stayed with you forever. Tell us about a few of them and how they still are part of your leadership style today. I remember when I first joined the Air Force, and uh, I joined for nothing more than discipline and structure in my life. And my English was still pretty broken when I entered basic training at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. But I recall probably about week two of basic training, one of the squad leaders got recycled for some unethical behavior. And I didn't think that I will get assign as the position, but the drill instructor at the time, training instructor, Staff Sergeant Timothy Herricks, he placed me in charge of that particular squad. And I remember just being both honored, but nervous about the task because, you know, here I am having challenges with the language itself. And, uh, I had to come up with a plan fairly quick on how I was going to do that because there were some pretty strong characters in that particular row of uh, racks or, or beds. <laughs> there always know? are. But the connection, I think, was, uh, was key to be able to connect with them and uh, find some common ground. And basically, it was graduation and get out of there without getting in trouble or any extra details. So we were able to collaborate fairly well. And that was one of the first moments to where I realized the importance of sound leadership and transparency with your teammates. After that, you know, we ended up uh, graduating basic training and I went to technical school and I didn't come into special operations right away. I went in as a traffic management specialist. And while I was going through tech school at Shepard Air Force Base, I was made a rope, basically one of the enlisted leaders for those formations that were attending technical school. And again, you know, so the cycle of leadership and wanting to get people to do what's right uh, continued from an early age. Then when I ended up cross-training into pararescue, 
because I was a cross trainee, a senior airman and E4 at the time, then I got assigned also as a leader of one another <laughs> row of racks of uh, even more interesting characters. So <laughs> there, there has been a continuum of development when it comes to my leadership method, but everything has been based on the same and just making sure that the collaboration is there so that the team can go ahead and achieve, get rid of the egos, get rid of the personal agendas, and just go ahead and get it done. So uh, those are just a few examples of the first five years. But those are kind of like the success examples. There's also been failures in there. Because in my first assignment, after I graduated Shepard Air Force Base, I got in trouble. And basically, I, I reverted back to the ways of the reasons why I joined service, meaning that I was just partying and just having a good old time. And I wasn't putting much effort into what I wanted to do with my future in my life. So I got assigned to a Racklin Air Station, Creek Grease, Greek Isles, middle of the summer, and I was bartending more than I was uh, conducting my duties as an airman. And I uh, got into a, a bad alcohol-related incident that involved fighting and driving, and uh, I got busted. And I spent some time with the cops that evening, sobered up, and then the next morning I had to go and see the first sergeant and the commander. I was given an Article 15. I got demoted. I had just put on my first stripe not two months before that. So I lost that stripe that I had just put on. And I thought I was going to get kicked out of the service because of, uh, of my actions that day. And it was, uh, it was just a horrible feeling that the same reasons that I decided to join service were going to be the same reasons that I was going to be put out of it. But the interesting part of that was that my immediate leadership really was no help when it came to it. There was some ridicule, some joking about, you know, oh, yeah, so your uniform, you know, you have those uh, those stripes ripped off right now. Everybody's going to know this. Uh, you know, you can't afford because you're now an airman basic again. So I was uh, I was pretty demoralized to a point to where like, well, maybe this isn't the place for me. But there was an NCO from an outside organization that ended up pulling me in under her wing and not only counsel me on what I needed to do next, but also develop a plan to be able to help me be better. And it just so happens that I chose to follow that plan and disregard all of the naysayers that were on the other side. And here we are today. So whatever that NCO told me uh, actually resonated. And I got to see also uh, some signs of weak leadership in there. My first line supervisor, first of all, was totally absent when I was in the dumps. The commander that actually awarded the Article 15 wasn't somebody that you will look at that had ownership, uh, ownership and presence as a leader of a military organization. The first sergeant was squared away. And I believe that he was one of the people that actually uh, ended up giving me a, a glimmer of hope that, you know, things aren't that bad and that I needed to learn from this. But at the end of the day, it was that sound example of leadership of that NCO that took the time to go ahead and make me realize, to take ownership and to go ahead and uh, carry on with a plan that will help me be better in the future. That's such a great story. Thank you for sharing that because... For people who have listened to most of my podcasts, almost to a single person, everybody has shared a story about how something went wrong in their career from a discipline standpoint. I've heard general officers and admirals talk about having non-punitive letters of caution and your story now. And I just think that there's something to be learned there by junior leaders to hear those stories about how mistakes can happen proper counseling and guidance can happen and people can go on to be the SEAC or a lieutenant general, even when there have been mistakes in their past. And I think there's such a quick trigger to just say, alcohol-related incident, you're gone. Alcohol-related incident, paperwork, you're, you're probably not very long for a military career. When in fact, it seems that those people who get in trouble who are then mentored and provided an opportunity to prove themselves, not only go on to have fantastic careers, I would argue are probably less likely to ever have another incident again in their life because they, they experienced that in their younger years and they've said, I'll never do that again. And there's so much to be learned from that. I'll never do that again and retaining that person in the military because their ability to go out and mentor others who are 
struggling with disciplinary problems or fitting in, or just let's just call it immaturity. And I'm wondering if you have any advice to a young leader on how to view and mentor and create a plan to save somebody who has gotten themselves in trouble, but has a lot of potential. I will tell them that, you know, all humans have flaws. Nobody's perfect. So how dare we judge anyone like we are? And I learned early on in my career that every saint has a past and every sinner's got a future. And sometimes it just takes a little bit of work for, to help people realize the mistakes. Now, if they own those mistakes and they use it as a leadership lesson learned, then by all means, that is credibility because you have been there. You're relevant to the issue. But the other part is, is that it helps you think through adversity. Because that is not the only time, even though you may not be getting in trouble, legal trouble, there's going to be plenty of tough spots that you're going to be placed as a leader. And now you have that method of thinking to where you can just think, all right, so things are not really all that bad because there's always a way out of it. And I think that that is one of the greatest values that you get out of uh, having some adverse action against you. Now, I'm not advocating for people to start going out and getting in trouble right oh, now so that they can, they can get street cred. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that if it happens, if you are on the receiving end, just realize that, hey, as long as you own it and you learn from it, you'll be good to go. And then for the leader that is taking care of that person, give them an opportunity to go ahead and get out of it. And then if they prove you wrong, you know, by means that they never repeat the act again and they learn from it, then good on the organization. And if they validate the assumption that, hey, this person is bad and they don't need to be here, then you give them a second chance to go ahead and do so. So it's a win-win for everyone. That's great. Following on that, that example, can you share a story with listeners about how some of those early moments that you just spoke about, how did they inform the tough or important decisions that you've had to take as a very senior enlisted leader, because you probably see a lot of the stuff come up. How did that impact your decision making, let's just say over the past five years? So those rough beginnings really gave me a, a, a keen sense of humility and ownership of actions, which in turn ended up developing some confidence because I was never shy about trying new things. I was never shy about going against the grain if things didn't make sense. I was not afraid to uh, speak my mind if something didn't seem right, because I was also, uh, I was also raised you know, under the maxim of loyalty is not mindless obedience. You know, sometimes the people that we admire the most can still get things wrong, and it is incumbent upon us if we're part of that circle to be able to help them out make the best decisions. But when we look at our formative years, especially those early days when we're trying to figure out exactly what our lot and our purpose is in life, I think that those are critical in the way that we're shaped as future leaders. And again, from my rough beginnings, that humility and ownership really played out in the end as I continued to, uh, to ascend through the ranks. That's great. I think that those are sage words for, for young leaders to think about as they develop their own leadership styles. You know, I know senior leaders are, are generally pretty humble about themselves, and I'm, I'm sure you're, you're the same. But do you remember the very first time where you just woke up one day and you're shaving in the mirror and you said like, you know, damn, I'm really proud of myself for what I just did. I will have to go back uh, to the time that I was in basic training. And, you know, there was a certain type of uh, not necessarily fear, but concern of whether I was going to do the right thing based on the expectations of my drill instructor when he placed me in a position of leadership. At the end of basic training, one of the biggest and proudest moments that we had as a team was the fact that we earned the honor of being an honor flight. You know, drill and ceremony was flawless. Our academic scores were great. And it was a collective effort from the team. And I think that that was one of the best lessons of being put in a leadership position that I learned, that the true satisfaction not comes from you looking at yourself in the mirror shaving saying, yeah, I've done great. 
is look it in the mirror in the morning and be proud to know that you're about to face many other faces that have a common goal and that are willing to do anything that it takes to go ahead and maintain the reputation and good standing of that organization. I think that that is probably one of the best lessons learned early in my career that I learned about leadership. Was there a time, can you reflect back on when you were a, a more junior leader? So I'm going to classify as your E5 and above years, where you look back on and say, I really wish I didn't do that. And if I had a do over again, I would take it. Do you have a story like that you can share with leaders so that they can look at that and say, hmm, there's something to take away from that and learn from? You know, I gave you the Article 15 story. That was definitely a. Uh a lesson learned of something that I didn't need to do. I also realized that uh, I was quick to uh, push people aside when they didn't seem motivated or where I didn't think that they were putting full effort into what they did. Something that I failed to realize in those early years were that you know, every person potentially has some value. And even though those particular people that I was just pushing aside because I didn't think that they were carrying their weight, the one thing that I failed to do is, number one, to go ahead and push them a little bit harder, or number two, if they weren't part of my immediate responsibility, to talk to their leader so that they can put a boot in their in their ass. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes, you know, just, you know, the Spartan babies over the cliff method didn't quite work well. Because at the end of the day, you're stuck with these people. They're working in your organization and all you're doing is just kind of like complaining about them instead of just pushing them to either go ahead and do what's right, hold them accountable, or give them an opportunity to get to get out and open the door for somebody else to come in. But it's something that in my early years didn't do enough because I was so concentrated on taking care of my group of people that were my immediate responsibility. And sometimes, you know, I let some of those other things slide because they weren't mine to own. Right. Motivation's an, an interesting word to me because we all talk about motivating others. And even in the civilian world, we talk about motivating others to, to live up to the expectations or whatever it was that they joined the service for. And I'll just make up an example that we can all relate to. You're on a you're on a run, a unit run, and somebody's falling out and you're back there kicking them in the butt, trying to get them moving and you're motivating them. But I found that, this is my personal opinion, so I'm interested in your your reaction and response to this, but I find it really hard to motivate people through language. And I find it much more effective to motivate people through setting the conditions for their success somehow so that they can motivate themselves. Because I look back on my career and my time as a civilian also, and I think nobody ever really motivated me. I always motivated myself because somebody set the conditions for me to motivate myself. Do you think there's anything to take away from your experience with trying to motivate others and apply that a little bit for a young leader to apply that a little bit differently and rather than look at it's my responsibility to actually motivate somebody and into an opportunity to say, I'm going to set the conditions for them to motivate themselves? And how would they do that? Part of this is personal discipline and, uh, you know, never help anyone who's not willing to help themselves. But helping themselves comes from awareness and expectations. You have to levy those upon them so that they know exactly what their left and right limits are. Motivation from me typically comes by example, actions. I speak very little. And then whatever the task may be, I go out and do it with them. An example of that is uh, physical fitness. You know, there were people that were struggling on the run because they were overweight and so on. So I will make the time early in the morning to go out to the track and work with them to help them be successful. Others, you know, I ended up spending the time riding you know, when it came, you know, they, they had a, a responsibility to provide written reports and the reports were really very canned, very uh, automated and didn't really say much. So I wanted to teach them how to properly care of people by stating the facts on paper and not coming up with embellished reports and so on. So I took the time to sit down with them and just let them practice different things. Take a paragraph and, uh, OK, this is what you're trying to say. Rewrite this. And then going back and forth, having that conversation with them so that they can see where my head was at and what the the outcome, the expected outcome will be. But I think that 
if you're thinking as a leader that you're simply going to go ahead and put a memorandum for record, some piece of paper that said, this is what we expect of you, and you don't exemplify it or you don't follow up to see how people are taking that guidance, eventually you're going to fail because uh, sometimes it falls on deaf ears. People are creatures of habit. And unless you're actually influencing, which is one of the key aspects of leadership, influencing their actions and then highlighting the fact that they're actually moving in the right direction or giving them a vector if they're going in the wrong direction, that guidance and interaction is really the saving grace for helping people become better. So that is something that I have always relied upon, and that is uh, actions and example in order to go ahead and shape behavior. I 100% agree with that. And, and I want to punctuate that for people who are listening and young leaders who are developing their own leadership style. I'm going to punctuate it with a, with a quick personal story. This is not my, my, this is a podcast for you to talk, but I will say this quick story that when I was a battery commander in an artillery battery and through actions, it, you have to, in an artillery battery, you have to move ammunition from a truck to the gun. And that requires, you know, a Marine to go stand at the tailgate of the truck, put a hundred pound round on their shoulder and walk it over to the gun and put it down where it's supposed to be. And so the Marines on the gun line would do that. And one night I said, I was, I was going to go down and start pumping some ammo with them. So it's nighttime. It's 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night. It's dark. And I'm in the line to stand at the tailgate and grab a round. So I grab around, put it on my shoulder and I bump into a Marine. And of course he has no idea who I am. And he fires off a bunch of expletives about watch where I was going. And, you know, and then somebody said, that's the CO. And he's like, Oh, sir, I'm sorry. What are you doing down here? I'm like, I'm pumping ammo, you know, just, and I just did it. And then all of a sudden there was this buzz about, Hey, the CO was down humping ammo on gun number one last night. And then gun number two, the next night said, hey, sir, when are you coming down to hump ammo with us? And then gun number three. And then all of a sudden it became this, what gun is the CO on? Because everybody else wanted to get their ammo put in place faster than the gun that the CO was on. It turned into this thing. And it, and it dawned on me. And that's not a story to brag about myself. It's a story to make the point, which is, and I didn't realize I was doing this. This is my realization of it is actions are so influencing when it comes to, to leadership. And I think your, your point about how you're influencing others with your action, influencing the actions of others through your actions, the story of being down the track. They're so fundamental to a young leader to understand that there's this sense of entitlement that you don't have to do things anymore as you get senior and senior. And this is both officer and enlisted. It's really important to, to not fall into that trap of, I don't have to do the hard work. I would encourage you to actually go do more of the hard work so people see you. I found that to be very valuable to me. I didn't realize I was doing it. I just learned it afterwards. Well, so we and, should... and it's a great point, sir, because it wasn't about you being the CEO just to go ahead and check on them. It became you being the CEO and taking their duty you know, into your own hands to show them that it is, in fact, important to you, that you want to understand and learn it. And it, it doesn't really take ammo cans or some heavy lifting to be able to demonstrate that every day, especially now in the social media environment, because as we're going through our Facebook page and LinkedIn and a couple of the other mediums that we use, people were actually put in the comments, it's like, yeah, you know, that, that guy speaking about me, you know, he is humble and he's, he's very kind, you know. I remember walking the halls of the Pentagon and he will be the only one that say hello or good morning to me on a continuous basis. So just a, a small act, I mean, five seconds out of your life of proper courtesy, you know, for people and just, you know, regard for their well-being or something else can pay dividends in the long run. Right. But it's all about being consistent on the way that you approach people and knowing that what you see it's what you get and that you're not putting a facade in front of them that that is the only time, sir, that you showed up to do the ammo cans because somebody else was looking. This is something that you do on a recurring basis because you really care about that force. Right. The episode with Lieutenant General Dave Bellin from uh, Marfor Res, he has this great comment because I asked him the question, how do you get out? It, it becomes easier to command when you're more senior and becomes harder to lead because you just have this bubble around you, right? Nobody's walking into General Milley's office and asking him how he's doing, right? No sergeant's coming in and saying, like, hey, sir, what's going on? And so you have this bubble around you. And so I asked him, I said, how do you effectively interact with the younger Marines when you're in this huge lieutenant general bubble? And he said, oh, 
I call it my movement to contact. He says, sometimes I'll just be, I'll be, I'll be like, you know, hey, I, uh, I need to get a drink of water. Or is there a soda machine around? Or, you know, I need to use the head. And he'll say, yeah, it's around the corner. And then he'll just start going, walking around and start talking to Marines. You know, hey, how's it going? Whatever. He calls it his movement to contact. And that's what he uses to, to kind of make sure that he is associating with the Marines and, and getting t- some time with them and showing them how interested he is in them as Marines. So you're, you're, you're right on with that. I know we talked a little bit about how you got in trouble in Greece, and I thought that was a great story. And you shared a little bit about how your command became absent, or some of your command became absent, and some of the NCOs really helped you out a lot. But is there another story where you can talk about how you saw something handled by a command and said to yourself, I will never do that. And if I ever see it done when I'm in a senior position, I will change that. Absolutely. And that one, believe it or not, is an easy one because it was accountability. So growing up through the ranks, you get to see that the military, regardless of service, they got very, very specific standards. You know, you have to be fit. You have to be lethal. You have to be obedient. You have to be loyal. And the list goes on. Take the core values of any service and it will describe that to a T. But when you start looking at the formations, you get to see that only a segment of those formations are really fully engaged in that behavior. Some are fat and lazy. Some others are insubordinate. Some are all about what they're going to get for their own gain and so on. So something that I, that I thought about specifically coming as a command chief master sergeant at the time was like, you know, if I'm ever, ever given the opportunity to go ahead and affect an entire formation, I'm going to draw the line on the sand and I'm going to start holding people accountable. And that is exactly what I did. It started with uh, enlisted performance reports to where not everybody got the highest rating. The Marine Corps got this probably better than anybody else when it comes to your reports. And, you know, when you look at a Marine Corps fit rep, I mean, it, it, you have a profile and people know whether you're on the high end or the low end, and then you get a medium somewhere in there. In the United States Air Force, about over 90% of the reports were everybody was the best of the best to where nobody really had anything to strive for. So I drew the line. I got to Okinawa, Japan, and uh, the EPR system for the Air Force, the enlisted performance report system, was about to change. And I gave the force a fair warning. It's like, hey, this is a whole person concept. You cannot be really good at turning wrenches, uh, wrenches but look like a marshmallow wrapped in dental floss in uniform. That is not going to cut it. I need you to go ahead and look at your core values, and I need to look at everything that you're supposed to be doing to be the best of the best. If you're doing that, then you're qualified for the best ratings. But if you have any shortcomings, we need to work on them, we need to fix them, and then we need to go ahead and move forward with the proper rating that fits the person that is in front of us right now. So the commander at the time had a couple of concerns because there was a, a flag officer somewhere in the chain that said, this, uh, this chief is trying to fix the Air Force in your base when nobody else in the Air Force is going to do this. You're going to hurt your people. And the expectation based on that comment coming from higher was for me to uh, cave in and just say, okay, we'll just let it slide. Hell no. I was raised uh, understanding that you deserve what you tolerate. And how dare we say that these are the standards by which we need everybody to abide in order to be a more lethal force on paper, but not exercise it with the formations that we're responsible for. So I didn't give in. I decided to just keep on going and going and going. I got plenty of IG complaints because I was, uh, you know, discriminating against fat people and everything. I was like, no, you're just unfit from duty. And either you, you, uh, you do it or you get the hell out of the way. You know, it's that simple, including with my own peers for the other E9s, which some of them were put on notice. But the bottom line was that, you know, if you don't set the tone for the standards as a leader, then there are no standards. And then you, specifically for me as a senior listed leader in that organization, I needed to make sure that my commanding officer was fully on board with this, which we have to have several conversations on doing right. But at the end of the day, I didn't uh, give in and say, all right, because that, you know, so many star generals said, so we're not going to do what's right. I said, no, if he wants to continue to, to do wrong, then by all means, keep on doing wrong. 
we're going to do it right here. And our people are going to know exactly what we're going to be doing because we're going to be transparent with them. But again, you're going to find yourself in certain situations to where people are just going to go ahead and, you know, just take the easy way out or make no ways. Man, if you own it, then own it, you know, and make sure that you hold people accountable and you set a record of excellence and an expectation of excellence for everybody to thrive in that uh, in that environment. That is really how you go ahead and shape the talent of the future. I agree. I love the thought about accountability and it. it prompts me to ask a question about how difficult it may be for young leaders to hold units accountable when they're mixed gender. So the the accountability issue, there is there is a set of standards and gender re- regardless. Do you have any advice for a young leader who's leading a unit that has both men and women in it and maybe struggling with holding one gender accountable to the standards and tackling that issue, I think it's tough. Well, what I will say to those leaders is when you are a military leader, you're leading soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, guardians, and so on. You're not leading female soldiers and male soldiers. I mean, everybody in your formation is your responsibility. And if you're not providing the same feedback, regardless of what gender they are, then you're failing as a leader. You know, yeah, there's uh, there's some value to being flexible when it comes to uh, taking each situation and on its own merit. But when it comes to gender, it shouldn't be any different. You hold people accountable and you make sure that you follow through on it. I'll share a personal ex- example of uh, of doing so. And this is, you know, going back to my command chief days to where uh, I spoke about the enlisted performance system. And, uh, you know, there was a, a specific senior NCO female that was being pushed for the next senior enlisted rank. And uh, it required a wing endorsement to make that happen. When I saw the member's record, I saw that, you know, the the narrative didn't really match the person. You know, very, very technically proficient, has some great qualities as a person, but her body composition was something less to be desired. You know, this person had not taken a PT test in over 10 years, and they were pushing her as the best of the best. To make the long story short, I went up the chain of command for that particular member, and I asked a simple question, who has given her feedback that she's grossly overweight? And a bunch of males in that particular, you know, sequence of uh, echelons were like, well, uh, chief, will you tell your wife that she's fat? I was just like, Well, uh, yeah, and I'm willing to deal with the consequences of doing so, you know, and I will explain why I'm, I'm telling her those things. But the problem here is that that member is being told year after year for over a decade that there's nothing wrong with her body composition where there is. So if you are not willing to do it, I will bring her in and have the conversation with her. And that is exactly what happened. I was like, well, good luck. So I brought her in, told her, hey, you're grossly overweight. You need to go ahead and do X, Y, and C. And if you would like to, I would love to go out to the track with you and start working with you to get better. One of those examples that I brought earlier. So she did. And uh, she hated me for about four months after I gave her the news. But then she came back and said, hey, uh, I really want to go ahead and take this on. I really want to be better. And at the end of the day, she tried really hard and she still didn't do it. And there were no empathy points because the standard was still there. She failed to do it. And the conversation was pretty simple. I asked her point blank, did you meet the goal that we set back a year ago? No. Do you think that you deserve stratification based on that? No. All right. Well, it's up to you. If you want to give it one more, one more try, then I'm here for you. But if not, you know, do whatever you need to do next. But leadership is not easy. And leadership is not going to be about just handing out coins, eating chicken dinners at night, and uh, just showing up when things go right in the organization. I think one of the key factors of leadership is uh, having that presence and that reputation for all of your people to know, number one, that you hold them accountable, number two, that you're living by the standard, and number three, that you're going to be fair in the process and provide opportunities. But I think regardless of gender, any leader should be able to go ahead and tackle that issue just like any other one. I agree. I recently saw a post on social media made by 
a female combat arms leader, enlisted NCO, who started to talk about her frustrations over men not holding women accountable to a standard. And she was a woman. She was a she's a woman. And she was upset about her perception of a different standard because men were too scared to actually hold women accountable to a standard. And I think that you nailed it, which is if you're, if you're a leader, you have the standards and that's your toolbox for accountability. And there doesn't have to enter in anything other than here's the standard and, and you're not meeting it. And I think that for the, the point I want to make to a young leader is that if you don't hold people accountable to a standard, regardless of gender, your reputation and presence, the two words that you use, Ziak, they start to suffer in the eyes of everybody you're leading. So the damage that can be done by not holding one person accountable can be catastrophic to your overall reputation. And your story of somebody for 10 years who hadn't taken a PT test, that's that's 10 years of leadership failure in a simple accountability of you have to take a PT test X times a year. I don't know what it is in the Air Force, but I'm sure there's some requirement for it. 10 years, that's a long time. Yeah, and if you wanna be a leader, you have to climb the mountain. You have no right taking the gondola all the way up to the top. You know, there's no special treatment. Everybody right. on their own merit. Well, well, thank you for bringing that up. I know it's a an interesting topic for leaders, and I and I got to imagine that uh, it's 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 difficult. But being a leader is hard, like you said. So on that note, it's hard to prepare yourself for the first time as a leader for when you have to put your foot down and say, "Hey, we're not doing that." Most likely to somebody in higher in your command, or maybe a peer, or your subordinates, I suppose, too. But generally, that time that you have to say no as a leader and put your foot down, it's not going to come at a time where you can really think through it. Can you help prepare young leaders for this inevitable situation by sharing a personal experience where you either saw it happen or you had to do it yourself and say, no? Well, it just so happens that I just shared that story of that particular yeah. flag officer, you know, wanting to uh, go along to get along and uh, holding my ground because I knew what was right. But I will elaborate just a little bit more on that particular topic that the reason I decided to stay in my position is due to the research that I conducted. And that research included the regulations, you know, the policies that actually drove that standard set. And the reason why the standard was set because of readiness and the reason that we needed to be ready, according to the slogan of the organization, you know, win tonight, fight tomorrow. And if people were not doing that, then we were just having a paper tiger for uh, the expectations for the force. So if you're going to hold your ground, you need to make sure that you don't go in with a with a shallow approach to the situation because somebody's going to go ahead and shoot holes all over what you're trying to say. Always have the depth of knowledge on the subject and be well informed and prepared to carry on the conversation to make sure that the right outcome is achieved. Just like a shallow pool, you wouldn't jump head first in there because it's catastrophic. Don't jump into a shallow argument or, a shallow, or take a shallow approach to the way that you fix issues and hurt your credibility in the process because you're just simply not being diligent enough to go ahead and hold your ground. Right. And you never, the, the standards are important all the time because you never know what you don't know and when things will change. And when you, when you think you have a lot of time to prepare and fix things, it turns out you may not. And you ask anybody in the 82nd Airborne right now, about you know being prepared they probably all have very current opinions on that situation i'm going to use that as an opportunity to launch into my next question which is or ask you to comment on this you know i think there's a big difference between battlefield courage and moral courage and so is there ever a time in your career where you know you had to risk your career with a decision that required moral courage I wouldn't say hurting my career because I never thought of it as risking my career, but I always thought of it as standing for what is right and always, you know, wanting to be the change that you want to see. I have been known for crushing personal agendas, 
specifically people that have ulterior motives for the things that they're doing, and always having the courage to go ahead and ask the questions, how is this good for the organization? How is this good for the institution? How is this good for the member? Never, how is this good for me? So always, always taking the approach of, you know, just looking at those lessons learned and the value that is added by taking any specific actions. But the most important factor on that is making sure to staying connected with the people in the trenches to see how they're going to react to any policy, to any news, any narrative that is displaced out there, you know, without their buying when it comes to it. There's going to be plenty of times to where you're going to get to see this. You know, if, if you were prepared for any meeting, by the way, my number one rule for meetings is to add value, not time. What that means is be prepared for the conversation and have your notes ready to make sure that you engage on the conversation. You never have time to get ready. You must always be ready for when those uh, situations come. And then, you know, have the courage to go ahead and ask those tough questions that nobody is wanting to ask. It happens every day here at the Pentagon right now to where I need to make sure that the message is well received by the force in this current information environment. Because it only takes one soundbite, you know, five second soundbite, one headline to send the troops, you know, off the deep. And I was like, what the hell are you guys doing nowadays? You know, and you guys right now is, is, is me, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here at the Pentagon, you know, making sure that we follow up with policies and so on. So my duty is always to go ahead and bring their concerns to the table. And I need to communicate with them and I need to have the goals and the courage the intestinal fortitude to be able to go ahead and look at that SES, look at the flag officer and say, hey, have you thought about how they are going to receive it? And is that really the best thing that we can do for them? So again, it just, it never stops. So it's, it's not just one incident, it's a continuum of incidents to where you continuously have to keep, you know, your peers and those above you in check just to make sure that we're doing the right things. Right. You have extensive combat experience as well in the special operations community. I'm wondering if you have a story, a story that you can share in a teachable way about any time you had to either execute or you witnessed both battlefield courage and moral courage. Oh, ab absolutely. So battlefield courage, I mean, that was easy. The people that I was surrounded by, my teammates, I mean, that was, that was basically a given. You never worried about your, about your flank with the people that you were stepping off the ramp with. Moral courage, I also got to see exemplified in there. You know, people just having the compassion to be able to go ahead and treat women and children with respect when getting to the objective. To be respectful of their livestock, you know, to make sure that you didn't breach some place that was going to go ahead and eventually kill animals and so on. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a bloodthirsty, vengeful endeavor every time we went to the eggs. What I got to see both from my Army and my Navy counterparts was uh, exemplified professionalism, day in and day out, and then reflecting on the actions of that day and then dealing with the, with the psychological tax that comes from, you know, having, you know, that be the norm for a 90 day, 120 day deployment. What I got to see is, you know, the hardest of the hardest, you know, just being able to have that compassion in their heart to realize that, man, these are people lives you're dealing with and uh, respecting human life in the process of getting after the bad guys that deserve the other end of the bargain. Yeah, um, that's interesting, the, the livestock thing, because as, as soon as you said that, it would be akin to just blowing up a grocery store. You know, I mean, you're just taking food and things away from people. And uh, that's, you know, the, the moral courage to stand up and say, hey, we need to respect this probably doesn't come very naturally to Americans. I mean, it makes sense when you think about it, but that sounds like a, a great teaching moment there. But not only that, on that, uh, on that moral courage piece, it's also the preparation and the expectation to be able to forecast these issues. Because there were times to where we couldn't help where animals were uh, going to be killed, specifically their cattle and so on. Mm -hmm. But we can prepare with money in case that happened to be able to go ahead and pay for the damage that we had inflicted just because it was a necessity of the of the operation. So again, just taking everything into consideration, just going in with a solid plan to be able to go ahead and uh, take care of people. Yeah, and that is a that is a leadership skill and like you said in the planning process, I don't know if we 
instinctively think about that when we're thinking about going out and operating kinetically. And then for somebody to say, we also have to consider this too. I think that's a huge teachable moment for young leaders to be thinking about in any sort of future conflicts. I have my own personal experiences with with being scared. And the first time I was ever scared, um, I wish that I had had the opportunity to think through how I was going to act when I was really scared. And I'm wondering if you can recall a moment where you were really scared and use it as an example to help young leaders prepare themselves for that inevitable moment when they're going to be scared, but they have to carry on and lead their men and women. Yeah, Phobos, the God of fear. Fear is nothing more than a, than a keen sense of awareness. And it is at the moment that you're the most scared to where you're the sharpest. Because all of your senses are just on high alert, and you tend to pay close attention to everything that you're doing. For us in my particular community, I mean, everything that we do has some kind of fear factor in it. Jumping, scuba diving in the dark, breaching, getting into an unknown building, uh, not knowing if the building is going to blow up after you breach it. Uh, so everything was always keeping you sharp when it came to it. But it's, uh, it is at those moments to where you have the most fear, to where you tend to react the sharpest in your life. And out of that fear, what I got to see was uh, valor, courage, and proper actions being taken. The opposite is getting complacent and not fearing anything. That's when you get careless. And the potential pitfalls of that we have seen play out over and over again, whether it's on accusations, on war crimes, you know, just the adverse actions of uh, some members in the special operations community. But when you quit valuing the things that keep you sharp and uh, you quit considering the surrounding collateral damage that can potentially occur if you're not at your best on that day, that's really when you become dangerous. And uh, for anybody out there listening, I will say that fear is actually a good thing. You know, there's nothing wrong with fear. My next question may be a little unusual, and it has to do with my experience in conventional units, having seen some special operations units and been around them enough to see how they operate differently. And your experience in a special operations unit, I find that the regular military units are seemingly much more rank aware and way more formal than the special operations community. For example, the special operations community seems to be much more familiar with each other in a way that transcends rank. Are there leadership lessons from the experiences that you have in the special operations community that can transfer to a leader in a regular unit, such as a squadron or a combat arms unit, that you can share some thoughts on why familiarity seems to work in the special operations unit, but it's eschewed in the regular units. And specifically, I just, everybody goes by their first name in special operations unit. Doesn't seem to matter from a leadership perspective, but you would never start calling your battalion commander by their first name in a conventional unit. Why does that work in special operations and not in the conventional unit? And I'm not advocating that it should work, but is there something to be taken away from that by a leader in terms of having some humility or maybe some familiarity is not such a bad thing with your men and women. Special operations is a very small and unique segment of the Department of Defense. And with that comes a lot of hard work, comes selection. There's a, a crucible, a right, a right of passage to be able to become a member of that particular group. And once you make it into that group, there's a mutual understanding of the hierarchy. You know, you don't have to throw titles or positions to assert yourself as a leader because everybody is a leader. Mm -hmm. There's also uh, an expectation that you, no matter how familiar you may be with the officer or the enlisted, that you're never going to cross the line. And there's also awareness that if you were to cross that line, that you're going to be held accountable for it. I think that those are some of the difference with differences between that particular community, which is typically a little bit more mature than the average formation on the conventional side to where young men and women need to understand that this is the way that the rank structure works and this is who is in charge and you do not do X, Y, and Z because that's actually being insubordinate. In special operations, we can have very, very candid conversations. And at the end of the day, if the right outcome is achieved, we keep on pressing forward. If somebody needs to get tuned up in the process of doing so, then we do it. And then it is understood before you leave that room. 
And it's just a different culture that is able to withstand the potential pitfalls of that familiarity. But I, I will tell you that every single person in special operations values vote the leadership and the friendship all in the same just because it's a necessity of the operations that they conduct. That may not be the same for a logistics squadron. That may not be the same for a maintenance squadron. And they need to make sure that they keep reminding people that there's a hierarchy here and this is the way that uh, we should communicate with each other. I don't think that it will work in the, the general purpose forces for that reason. Just because some people need to constantly be reminded that they are, in fact, still in the military and you're not in some club. And we get to see that more often and often uh, nowadays to where, you know, we're dealing with a different generation coming in. Uh, some that may think that orders are suggestions and that are thinking that they have a say on everything that happens. And that is not do as I say, don't do as I do. That is simply the fact that a military entity is an obedient one that obeys lawful orders and executes them to the best of their abilities. Sometimes we don't have the time for people to... Uh, Go ahead and debate that. Right. And uh, if the facts are laid in front of you and if the orders are clear and they're up to you to execute, then by all means do it. And if you're not willing to do that, then we need to find, to find somebody else that does that. Right. So that is probably one of the potential pitfalls of going to first names with other people, with other communities or segments of our Department of Defense. Yeah, I agree with you. There's, I don't think it would work either. But you did say some things that are very interesting from a leadership perspective that maybe are could be formative to a young leader when they go out, if they could encourage some of those behaviors that you mentioned that does make that familiarity work. You specifically said, everyone in your team is a leader. And I started to think to myself, if I'm a platoon commander, what if I had my culture in my platoon be like, I view everybody in this platoon as a leader, regardless of rank. Everybody has a leadership role. Because they say, if there's two Marines standing around, somebody's in charge. So I, I always look at everybody as a leader and certainly a potential leader. If young officers and NCOs viewed their, the team that they're leading with everybody in there as a leader, that, that's a great cultural mindset to have. And then you also made the comment that I wrote down too, which I thought was fantastic, which was in your special operations community in a small group, you're able to have very candid conversations. I think that there is a place for very candid conversations in the regular force regardless of rank, like in after action reviews or something like that. So if young leaders are fostering a sense of candid conversations at the appropriate time and place, or even asking why did we do this or why did we do that in the appropriate time and place, so long as it doesn't substitute in for lack of discipline and, and not listening to orders, because there's a time and a place for do this and you do it. And there's a time and a place for educating your younger leaders by explaining the decision that you made or actually asking them for some debate or, hey, how would you do this? And I think those are, you said two really great things that I think are completely implementable into any unit by a leader, whether they're enlisted or officer, that can make their unit stronger and better. Yeah, and debate is critical for making the best decisions and getting everybody else's input. You know, there's a lot of uh, churn out there about diversity and inclusion. And let me tell you what diversity and inclusion is for me. Diversity is nothing more than the humans that are already in the force and we're making it work. Inclusion is to give them an opportunity and give them a voice to be able to go ahead and cover the blind spots of the other segments of society that grew up in a different environment than who they are. It has nothing to do with color or skin or anything like that. It has to do with the outcomes that we generate as a Department of Defense when it comes to lethality and when it comes to crushing our enemies. And that's the reason that we enlist people from across the nation, because we want that difference in thought, that diversity in thought, for people to be able to go ahead and add further value to the views of people that somehow think that maybe they have all the answers, when there's something else that they haven't tried that can potentially be a tipping point for some improvement or innovation. And that is really where we as the Department of Defense stand with that. It's not about a damn poster. It's about the capabilities, the combat capabilities of our nation. Exactly. I, I always view diversity, and, and I do this in, in my civilian company that I own, I look at diversity as diversity of thought. That's what we're all trying to accomplish. We're trying to get that diversity of thought. And the diversity of thought comes from the diversity of the force and, like you said, their backgrounds and how they can view things through a different lens and cover down on the blind spots with the ultimate goal being 
lethality first. So like you said, it's not about the poster, it's about the diversity of thought. And that comes back to what I was just saying about leaders. If leaders create the opportunity for everybody to sit down and say, let's talk about this training exercise we just did. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about that. And you get that diversity of thought and conversation, that candid conversation that you were talking about that makes the special operations team so valuable. I really think young leaders can incorporate those candid conversations and leverage the diversity in their organization to cover down on all those blind spots and ultimately increase lethality and increase the capabilities of whatever organization you're leading. It could be a motor transport mechanic section. It could be aircraft maintenance, but the diversity of thought is really important. And I want to come back to the diversity of thought too, as it relates to the PJ community, what little I know about it, because it does affect leadership to where there are so many experts in the PJ community, but new officers must be rotating into teams where there are people like you that have been there for 20 years. And that person who's been there for 20 years has seen it come and go and come and go. And the importance of a young leader to leverage that experience to make themselves better and the responsibility of that senior enlisted who's been there for 20 years to then create a better officer by mentoring them. Do you have some experience to share there about some interactions that you had with officers when you were younger and then officers when you were older from the standpoint of mentoring them? So I think this is this is more of a conversation about egos. So often on both sides of the coin, you have an officer that comes in that I'm in charge. I'm going to do things this way, disregarding the experience of that team that they right. are uh, leading. On the other side, the flip side is that senior NCO that has been there for a long time, knows the personalities, knows exactly how that team operates and goes in. It's like, Lieutenant, you don't know Jack. You know, you listen to what I say and do what I do, blah, 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 blah. So you got to find a happy medium in there. So my advice for any leader on either side of that coin is to check the egos at the door and collaborate from the beginning. You know, the first role that that officer should take when coming over to a new team is to have that listening session with that senior enlisted leader. Tell me about the culture of this team. Tell me about what is important to them. Tell me about how they embrace the mission. Tell me about the things that they do not value. Tell me about the shortfalls that they have that is impeding their success. And then let's develop a plan on how we facilitate all of those things to make sure that they stay mission effective. That is really how the conversation should go when it comes to it. But if either side has an inflated ego that is not willing to go ahead and collaborate, then the machine eventually is going to fail. So again, be open-minded, check bias and egos at the door, and be able to go ahead and realize that you are a leadership team, nothing else. And you're going to set the tone for the way that that formation operates. If you fail to do that, then expect to deal with the consequences of uh, failing to do so. Right. It's such a valuable observation, SIAC, because it is all about listening and I have this saying, I didn't invent the saying, I don't know where I heard it, so I can't take credit for it, but I use it all the time, which is leaders are never judged on how many people they lead. They're judged by how many leaders they create. And if you adopt that mindset as a leader, whether it's an enlisted or officer, if you, if you take that and apply it to everything you're doing, that your goal is to leave more leaders than you came in with, create those leaders. That should wipe the ego out and say, like, let's leverage each other's positions and experiences and roles here to make the team a better organization. I think if junior NCOs look at it as they have a responsibility to create the next level, the next NCOs that are coming in and staff NCOs have, say, it's my responsibility to create leaders out of these new officers that are coming in. And then conversely, for those, the junior enlisted or the junior officers to be receptive to that mentorship. Is, is key to lifelong career development for everybody. Yeah, it's, it's about nothing more than building the bench. You know, we, we eventually, every single one of us has got an expiration date. And if we're not doing our best to go ahead and create the leaders of tomorrow, then we'll fail in the organization in the, right. in the most catastrophic way. 
I want to transition over to something that we talked about earlier, which was information warfare. I think this is my personal opinion, just from being really active on social media. But to me, information warfare is is the new battlefield out there. And it has the ability to impact leadership and decision making at almost every level in the military. And our enemies seem deft at employing tactics that are effective in shaping information operations. How can leaders, both senior and junior, enlisted and officer, better command that space, not only from a tactical perspective, but as a practical leadership tool as well? On the practical side of things, one of the most important things that you can do as a leader is just to have transparency with facts. But that cannot be episodic. I mean, that has to be a constant with your people. You have to constantly communicate with them, have access to the information, provide them access to the information while maintaining the trust. Because if you're thinking that you're going to go ahead and combat the amount of information that is flowing to them via their phone, their computer, their iPad, and so on, you are grossly mistaken. But what they need to know is for everything that they hear out of any one of those devices is that they can come back to you and say, hey, boss or uh, CEO or chief, what is the background on this? You know, be able to dig deeper into the issues to know that you're not being had by somebody with an ulterior motive to go ahead and disrupt your good order and discipline. And that is happening day in and day out nowadays. I mean, you cannot flip a channel, a web page, some paper, some magazine that doesn't have an agenda that is disruptive in nature. And we need to be more astute than our enemies, because even Sun Tzu said, as the Chinese said this years ago, centuries ago, that warfare is nothing more than, you know, disruptive, you know, information, misinformation. We need to make sure that all of those deceptive tactics are being mitigated by people that are properly thinking about the issues that they're dealing with and not be so easily influenced to where they also act as a multiplier or a sensor or an amplifier for that misinformation to other people, which we're seeing that quite often nowadays. As a leader, you need to make sure that number one, you're prepared to have the tough conversation with your people Be able to go ahead and walk right through the bias, that brick wall that is already imposed because they're thinking that something is being done wrong and be able to just go ahead and crush it and let them know that, hey, look, nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it. So on the other part of that is that for every story that's out there, there's probably about five different viewpoints that counter some of the accusations they're in. And you need to make sure that you look at it from every single angle. But the most important thing that you need to look at are the facts. What is it that we know for sure? You know, instead of going with perceptions, you know, accusations and some of the other rhetoric and narrative that is out there when it comes to the way that we think things should go. The last part of that is that we have to realize that leaders, that there's a lot of armchair quarterbacks out there that either have a platform or they have an agenda to sell. And they will take that information and exploit it to the best of their abilities just to go ahead and get their likes. So don't don't fall victim for that crap. You know, just have this common sense to be able to go ahead and talk to somebody that have access to the information and get the facts before you form your own opinions on any particular subject. Yeah, I feel that. And and I just go back to the recent evacuation back in in August and all of what I thought was disinformation that was going on. And the first thing I thought to myself was, if you think that a unit coming out of, well, I'm just going to use the civilian terms for it, okay, SEAC, so Delta Force or SEAL Team 6, okay, and you think, hey, anybody that goes up against those teams are probably have a very high probability of losing any sort of fight because they're that good. Okay, now imagine that our enemies have the equivalent of that in the information space and how good they are at it. They are just as good at manipulating the information space as guys out of Bragg and Damn Neck are at doing their jobs. And what they're doing that's different is they are creating a non-kinetic weapon out of you when you spread the disinformation that they have convinced you of. How much people are participating in the actual conduct of our enemies' disinformation campaigns. 
Well, I mean, and they would like nothing more than to rip away at the fabric of what this nation stands for, and that is unity. United States of America, right? You know, it's not the divided States of America, but now they're seeing a prime opportunity, you know, using politics, using many other things to go ahead and get our country divided so that they can go ahead and come in as the savior of something. Don't forget that both of our strategic power competitors have wanted to go ahead and assert themselves as the prime partner of choice globally, you know, and how are they going to do that? By moving us out of the way. And what is the best way to move us out of the way militarily? Maybe they can, because we have proven over and over again that we have the greatest capability, you know, ever known when it comes to military uh, firepower. But they're using the, the diplomatic, the information, and the economic means to be able to go ahead and get people to go ahead and get away from us and disrupt our alliances and our partnerships so that they can then come in and become the partner of choice. But the one thing that we can do as Americans is to go ahead and stand united. Don't let any of that stuff separate you from your neighbors, you know, from your people out there, from services. I mean, we're better than this. And we are smarter than that to fall for any kind of uh, narrative out there that is designed to do just that. So, you know, as Americans, you know, I look at the scholars right behind my shoulder and man, that is a symbol of pride. You know, it is sacred. It is sacred for me. And I will, I, I swore that I will give my life in the support and defense of the Constitution of the United States and make sure that that banner hangs there proudly. So I don't take any crap from anybody disrespecting it. You know, I, I truly live by my oath. And I memorized that oath because it's really the definition of who I am as a human being. The military really gave me a purpose in life and defined me as an American citizen as a fighter for freedom, to make sure that everybody in this land is able to go ahead and benefit from that way of life. And I'm not going to let somebody with some narrative, using computers, proxies, bots, you name it, to go ahead and start ripping away at that, because that is not what Americans deserve. America is better than that. What can leaders do today to make sure that the facts are being presented to everybody to maintain that the fabric of unity that's so important to our country? One of the most important things that you can do is you need to stay connected to your people. You need to interact. You cannot afford doing this by interneting. So when your people are showing concerns, go ahead and talk to your squad leaders. Go ahead and talk to those, to those line NCOs and petty officers that are having interactions, daily interactions with, the, with junior troops and know what is concerning them. And then take the time to be able to gather them around campfire style and talk to them about the issues that we're facing at the moment. There are so many people out there with misinformation. And I ask them the simple question. Have you talked to your squad leader? Have you talked to your sergeant? To your first sergeant, well, no. Why not? Well, they're not accessible. Well, why not? COVID. Well, <laughs> there's a thousand reasons why not to communicate face to face, but everybody is actually reading this garbage that is put out there to disrupt their communications. Right. So, if you're a leader and you have a responsibility for a formation. Take the time to talk to them face to face and make sure that they understand the facts for what they are so that they can stay focused on the mission. Yeah, I think there's such a huge opportunity. And we talked about this a little bit offline, but there's such a huge opportunity for senior leaders to really embrace the digital medium as a way to say, this is me telling you, this, these are the facts. And we can communicate facts so easily now as senior leaders. And I'm starting to see more people adopting the digital medium as a way to communicate facts to people. And I hope that keeps going. For junior leaders, a little bit less, uh, you know, I'll share a quick vignette myself on something that was successful to me too. But in the Marine Corps, we have this thing called the Lance Corporal Underground. And it's this joke about how the E3s know more about what's actually, get, what's actually happening than anywhere else. And the E3 and the Lance Corporal Underground is always right. And it's sort of a joke. But it's the gossip channel of the enlisted Marines. And so when I was a battery commander and there was some current events going on that made everybody speculate that maybe our unit would be activated to go do something, the Lance Corporal Underground exploded with rumors. And so I just stood in front of my formation one day and I said, hey, everybody at ease. And I said, hey, I want to hear from the Lance Corporal Underground. What's the Lance Corporal Underground saying right now? Like, seriously, raise your hand and tell me what you guys are talking about. 
And some Marine raises his hand, he's like, hey, sir, we're hearing this. I'm like, well, I, from who? Because that hasn't come from me. So who are you hearing it from? Is it your buddy? Or are you talking to the battalion commander? That's it. And as soon as I started asking them what they were gossiping about, it was amazing how much information I learned and how I could actually take rumor and apply it to facts and confirm something or say like, hey, you know what? I don't have an answer to that either yet, but I'm working on it. And I gained a lot of insight from that. I'll encourage people, like you said, get out with your line NCOs, get connected with your people, find out what the junior troops are saying, find out their concerns and address them as a leader. I think it's a huge, huge lesson for, for people to apply. Um, so I, I love that vignette that you used. I have several personal and very raw experiences as it relates to service member suicides. And I dare say I've lost as many friends to suicide as I have to combat, which is very unfortunate. I feel like there's a lot of opportunities to fight this institutionally, but even a greater opportunity as we stand shoulder to shoulder with our fellow warriors every single day. What advice do you have to share with junior leaders to help them not only identify potential risks in the ranks, but also to facilitate treatment and very specifically, how do we remove the unfair stigma that is associated with seeking help? I think that we're at a point right now in our Department of Defense, especially after 20 years of armed conflict, to where we understand that you know you cannot evade the psychological issues that come with being involved in combat for that long. We have learned quite a bit since the Vietnam days on how to better treat our people. We continue to tailor the system to be not necessarily empathetic, but uh, accommodating for the people that are actually experiencing this trauma, which is non-visible often and uh, easy to hide. I myself was one person that stayed 15 years under the, the radar. And the only person that knew the ugly side of me was my spouse. She asked me several times to get help, and I refused to do so. Why? Because I had an outlet, and that outlet was alcohol and the friends that were dealing with the same stuff that uh, I was dealing with. And with that brought some violence and many other things, and I was not in a good place in life. Finally, I had to roger up and go and get help. And it was at that moment when I finally came clean about my issues that I felt liberated, you know. Part of the reason I didn't do it before, because I, like many of the people that are listening right now, I did not trust the system. I thought that the system will actually take me off the line, take away my rating and not allow me to do what I knew to do best, which is operating special operations. So I didn't do it almost at the expense of myself and my family. But once I finally did, I developed confidence to be able to be open about my issues. I was uh, able to go ahead and talk to other members that were able to then seek help. And uh, one life save is one life. That is a huge win for everybody in today's environment. We have to realize that this is not just a Department of Defense issue. This is a, a society issue. When you look at the suicide rates now in our schoolyards because of bullying, people are getting accustomed to using this particular act as a way out of problems. And it is unacceptable. And that is the same society that feeds the Department of Defense. And then we put more stress on them, which makes them apt to go ahead and do that. And then sometimes when they depart service and they don't have that sense of identity, that sense of value, that sense of purpose, then they tend to go ahead and commit the act on the right side of, uh, of service. So we need to go ahead and really take a very aggressive approach to provide people with opportunities to be able to go ahead and continue to thrive in life based on the experiences that they have. Because it takes a very special person to do what a military person does, and that is to serve. To be able to go ahead and sacrifice it all, go abroad in foreign lands, to be able to ensure that we maintain the American way of life. Now, when you lose that mechanism, that supporting mechanism, that's when the wheels start coming off. But it starts with getting help, and there's nothing wrong with getting help. And me as the SEAC, ever since I assumed my responsibilities, I've been telling people, if for some reason you're skeptical about being put out to pasture, being put out to service or anything else, communicate with me directly. I will help you get the help that you need. At the end of the day, we want you to be a productive member of society. And we don't want you to become another statistic, another number, another bleep on a spreadsheet that you succumb to the horrors of suicide. We need to do better than that. 
And people got to realize that their value is far more alive than dead in many of these places. You know, there's nothing, nothing good about taking your own life. You affect the lives of many others. You disrupt the cohesive nature of any particular unit. And at the end of the day, man, you're just adding on to the problem. Just make sure that you're able to go ahead and work through these issues because you're not alone. There's many, many of us that are struggling every day. Just yesterday, as a matter of fact, I have my uh, fifth treatment of the stellar ganglion block. And that is the needle that goes through my neck that actually resets my brain in order for me to be not as high strong as I typically am. And I do that because it helps me be productive. I do that because it keeps me off the ledge. And I do that because it's good for my family and the people around me, including my teammates here at the office of the SEAC. There is no shame in doing that. Man, just get the help that you need and continue to be a productive member of this great society. And then on the tail end of that, we'll provide you with opportunities to continue to thrive in life. I'm currently working with the Department of Education on one side and the Department of Labor on the other to make sure that veterans continue to capitalize on the great skills and knowledge and experiences that you have garnered through your time in service. Whether it's six years or 20 years or 30 years, there's a lot of value to each and every one of you. Don't sell yourself short and don't take the easy way out when it comes to despair. Make sure that you work through it and make sure that you're able to go ahead and continue to uh, be a productive member of society. You know, I hear so many stories about people who have been physically injured in combat, lost a leg and had a prosthetic uh, replacement, and then they end up back on active duty, and in some cases, even back in their special operations command. So the institution has precedence for healing people and putting them back online in the physical realm. I think that that has to be accounted for by people who are worried that they'll be taken offline for non-physical injuries and emotional injuries. I think that that speaks volumes about if you want to get back online, if you seek treatment and you want to get back online, it's no different. Getting back online, if you want to get back online, there are opportunities for you to get back online, but healing yourself is the first step in that. And you mentioned the alcohol thing, and I'll tell you that every single experience that I have with veteran or or uh, service member suicide, every single one of them involves alcohol at some level. And I'll just say as a public service announcement that if you're dealing with things with alcohol, you are moving in the opposite direction from healing. Even you may think it's making you feel better, and it is not. And to your point, seeking help found you a treatment that replaced that. and it's, you're doing well with it. And I think that that is an example for everyone to follow. You mentioned before that if people felt like they were worried about getting help or anything like that to contact, you know, get in touch with you directly, how would somebody actually do that? How would somebody reach out for help to you? Or is there somewhere else that you feel that they should reach out for help to that is more immediate? So military one source is the prime avenue to be able to seek immediate help. And if you get into treatment and you feel like you're not going in the direction that you think you need to go, I'm the only Cologne hyphen Lopez on the global. So you can find me on the global address list, send me an email direct, and I will get to you in two minutes or two days. And that is a promise. That's great. I think that's fantastic. So it's military one source is the primary. And then if you feel like it's not taking you down the correct path or you you don't feel like it's serving you well to reach out and get some help through your email address on the global. And I think that's a very generous offer. Thank you, SIAC, for for making that available to everybody. Will you take a few minutes to tell future leaders listening to this episode what total force fitness is? And how this will be something to empower young leaders with increased awareness and facilitate preventative care for our warriors? Absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned amputees being returned to duty, even in special operations. Well, that is uh, synonymous with uh, changing a tire that is blown in a vehicle. You know, we do that day in and day out. We put great time, resource and focus to maintaining things. But we haven't always taken the same effort in maintaining the human weapon system, the flesh and bone. Our medical system can definitely use uh, a few changes in innovation on the way that we treat uh, injuries 
in the military. And I'll just use a vignette as an example. So if you have knee pain, the way that it works, you go to the clinic, you go uh, take a number, you go into that room, they take your vitals, they ask you what's wrong, you tell them you have pain in your knee. That provider goes to that back room. They look at whatever books they look. They come back and tell you, all right, yeah, so you have knee pain. Uh, Take some of this. And then if it gets worse, come back and uh, we'll go ahead and do something different. The direction that we're wanting to go is for a member to have a profile, a profile basically head to toe to where when they show up to that sick bay, that uh, hospital waiting room, and they're seen on first sight somebody's got the whole history in there. It's like, all right, so you're here for knee pain. And uh, okay, so first thing that I'm looking at right now is that you're about 15 pounds overweight. That places a lot of stress on your joints. So how did it happen? All right, shift in motion. Okay, so that may be a part of it. Okay, so now let's talk about the weight. Uh, What happened? How come your weight is increasing? Do you have some added stress? Is he stressing? Let's check your cortisol levels and see what uh, what your system is doing on the inside and see what we can do. So you start looking at all of the potential issues that are leading to that one particular problem to make sure that you not only mitigate it, but you eliminate it and you bring self-awareness to the member on what they need to be doing to live a whole healthy life when it comes to diet, when it comes to stress, when it comes to physical fitness, when it comes to financial fitness, being able to take care of the people that they're responsible for and so on. So total force fitness is just that. It's a holistic approach to dealing with uh, interpersonal human behavior and also with physical performance to create the most ready person, the most lethal entity to be able to carry the tough duty of defense of the nation. Right now, this is what the Office of the SEAC is concentrating on this uh, calendar year. And we have uh, some uh, initiatives already on board, including a Department of Defense instruction and a Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff instruction to provide overarching support to the services to be able to go ahead and increase the support for their programs. Like the Army's got the holistic health and fitness. You know, the Air Force has got True North as an example. So we're trying to create a whole system approach to be able to better care for our humans left of the bank on the preventative side instead of the reactive nature that we have in our current health system. Now, I do have to say that our health system is currently stressed. We don't have enough providers to do what we need to do. We don't have enough uh, uh, facilities to be able to do what we need to do. But there's a way to get after that by creating these cells that can potentially go ahead and bring that awareness to prevent injury instead of flooding a system that is not uh, what it used to be 20 years ago, expecting them to fix everybody in the service. That's great. That sounds like it's it's going to be a great program, I think, a, a holistic approach. I mean, you and I came in, we started our military careers around the same time. It seems so much different now, just the holistic care, the focus on proper diet, better exercise. I mean, when you and I came in, we were running five miles in those old black boots with no foot inserts in them. I just think we've gotten so much smarter <laughs> over 30 years. And it sounds to me like this program, I know you're laughing because you know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, I know. Um, (laughs) My joke is that I think I was born as somebody who was going to grow into being six foot one. And I ended up being five, eight because of the weight I was carrying in the bad boots just shrunk my entire body down to five, (laughs) eight. But uh, my wife doesn't buy that. But yeah, the, and it sounds like this program is something that is going to be really instrumental in taking where we are right now over the next 30 years. And I just think it's, it's so important and it, and it will increase lethality and it will, if we have healthier, stronger warriors in all the branches, it's, it's only going to increase our lethality down the road. So it sounds like a really great initiative. And uh, I look forward to reading more about that coming up on my final questions here, you know, a, a reoccurring guest theme on this podcast is how essential thinking, reading, and continuing education is in the development of leaders at all ranks. And when looking at the potential future conflicts that we could be facing and the serious likelihood that it'll be very decentralized joint fight, what initiatives are you and your team in the office of the SEAC undertaking or in the chairman, the chairman's office 
to bolster the opportunities for senior leaders to increase their joint fighting skills and their knowledge. It just so happens that it was a Marine Corps Sergeant Major that says, the days of dumb and strong are over. We need thinking warriors on the battlefield. A couple of years back, both the chairman and I put out a vision for the joint military education of officers and enlisted personnel in the Department of Defense. And that was uh, designed to be able to go ahead and increase the strategic context on the mindset of our professional military education members to be able to go ahead and think deeply and broadly about any issue that they may encounter. And we already beat this horse to death about misinformation campaigns and so on. But we cannot understate the value of the human weapon systems uh, when it comes to warfare, regardless of what unmanned systems we got out there on any tarmac, ship deck, or silos. We need humans to operate those things. And a perfect example of that was the Theodore Roosevelt when he got docked in Guam because of the COVID pandemic. You know, we need to make sure that we have healthy humans to be able to go ahead and be postured to globally employ those military instruments of war at any time, at any place, under any stress conditions. So our approach to military education is just that, that there's going to be certain gates that are going to be met by the services with their Title 10 responsibilities and their professional military education initiatives. Then we're going to plus them up with some joint education that is sequential in a continuum throughout their careers. And we're also encouraging many other avenues for civilian education to be able to go ahead and increase their cognitive capacity to be able to deal with stress, be able to analyze problems, and to be able to go ahead and continue to add value to the organization. So all of those doors are open, and we're also continuing to narrow the gap between officer and enlisted education, because we know that 80-something percent of the force is enlisted, and at times officers are not going to be present to be able to go ahead and affect that whatever mission they may be undertaking. So we need NCOs and petty officers to be ready to go ahead and be up to task to be able to fill that role in the absence of orders. So again, it's something that we're taking uh, very serious. We spent uh, last year working on that, uh, on that initiative, and it is now in place. As a matter of fact, this next month, we're having a course for E6s and E7s on this strategic con context of government, the purpose of the military, the way that we are funded, the way that the combatant commands execute that mission, and the way that the services provide the assets to be able to go ahead and affect those missions on a global scale. So again, we're not waiting until they become senior NCOs or they're filling flag positions. We're doing it way left of the band when they have learned to be the best soldier, sailor, airman, Marine, Coast Guardsman, and Guardian. And then we're giving them the information. It's like, hey, this is the deeper context on how this machine works. So that way they're able to go ahead and stay focused on the mission without any of the misinformation that is out there about what you can do and cannot do, how a budget works, you know, how come we don't have much of this and we have less of that? How are we expected to do more with less? All of those narratives that are out there, we, we want them to be able to answer their own questions because they understand how the system works. That's, you're going to have a line out the door for people that want to go to that course. It sounds fantastic. It comes back to that conversation we were having a few minutes about disinformation operations. And the more educated and the more you know, the more you're able to actually synthesize facts and communicate them back down to people that you're leading to assuage the effort or to, to mitigate the implications of a disinformation operation that's you know going on with our enemies. There's a saying in the Marine Corps, but it really applies to all the services, which is, you know, NCOs are the backbone of the Marine Corps. We say that all the time. While that's true, it's really the NCOs are the background of the Department of Defense. Uh, just across all the services. And so opportunities for, for NCOs to go out and learn more and become an even more lethal warrior. It's so fantastic to hear that, that there are courses that are being created for that. So I look forward to hearing more about that and actually look forward to maybe speaking to somebody who graduates from that class soon and hearing how great it is. So I will be paying attention to that. We're coming up on the end. So what I like to do normally at this point is recap some of the highlights that you talked about, see if that sparks a final thought for you. 
so we started out by having a conversation about the history and the actual rank of SEAC. And then I, I asked you about some of the early parts of your career and wrote down that you said that it was influential to you to emulate others. And you used three words, which were humility, discipline, and compassion. And then you talked about early in your military career, uh, how important discipline and structure was in life and why that was something that led you to join the Air Force. And then you told the story about in week two of basic training, how your your basic training leader had been recycled for some unethical behavior. And you were all of a sudden got put in charge of a squad and that you were not only thrust into a leadership position, but you were still having some challenges with with a new language. And then the lesson that you learned out of that as a young leader was to connect and find common ground with your people by collaborating with them. And that was your first experience in leading and developing teams and teammates. And then you talked a little bit about how you went on to technical school, the traffic management school, and uh, you were an enlisted leader there as well. And then on to PJ as an E4, and you were again a leader at that school. And you found you you stated that those things that you mentioned early on, the discipline, compassion, and humility, and collaborating with teammates served you well in those follow-on leadership positions. I asked you a question about failures, and you talked about how uh, after being at Shepherd Air Force Base, you had gotten in trouble for essentially being immature and had an alcohol-related incident, and you were busted and and. You went to see the first you went to see the first sergeant and the CO, and you had an Article 15 and lost a stripe, and you were going through thoughts that you were going to be kicked out of the Air Force, but that in fact didn't happen. You've gone on to be the absolute senior enlisted person in the entire Department of Defense, and that moment in leadership with you was that an NCO came along and developed a plan for you to be better, and there was a plan in place that resonated with you, and what really resonated with you the most was that your first line manager was the term you, I think you used your, I'm going to say, I'm going to say your immediate supervisors. He was absent when you were in the dumps and some of your other leaders were absent as well. But there was that one NCO that came to you and said, here's a plan to make you better. That was a crystallizing moment, a moment in leadership that was very influential to you for the the rest of your career. And then you you made a statement, which I wrote down, which was every sinner has a future and how important it is to think through adversity at any level when you're experiencing it at any point in your career. We talked about your formative years were really grounded in uh, the ownership of being the humility of a leader. And then I asked you a question about t- to tell me a time that you were proud of yourself. And you you went on and say that you were worried that you weren't going to live up to the responsibilities of all the leaders that you had in boot camp. But then when you look back at the moment that you were proud of yourself was when your squad in boot camp was awarded the honor flight designation for being the most squared away with grades and formations and uh, drill and everything else. And that was that was a proud moment, probably the time in your career when you said, you know, geez, maybe maybe I am cut out for this. Maybe I am much more of a better leader than I gave myself credit for. I then followed that up with a question about like, what would you do as a do-over? And we went back to the Article 15 again. And you said that it's really important for leaders not to be so quick to push people aside when they're not motivated. And as leaders, it's it's our responsibility to evaluate whether, you know, people like that, people who are in trouble are worthy of being pushed aside or are worthy of further motivation. We went on to have a conversation about how to motivate people. And you said three things. You said, motivating others is about instilling personal discipline, having awareness, and then setting the example, and then showing up with examples. Your quote was, influencing their actions through your own actions. And I thought that was a fantastic statement about how to motivate people as a leader that is applicable to anybody listening. We went on and we talked about what did you see go wrong over your career? And you immediately said accountability and how important accountability is to maintaining a fit, lethal, and dedicated, loyal force and holding people accountable 
how important it is to be the uh, the whole person, right? And you use the example of you can be a great wrench turner, but if you look like the marshmallow man, you're not really the whole person. And you have to have accountability for not only being technically and tactically proficient with wrench turning, but personal discipline and maintaining yourself to a standard of fitness that that we all expect everybody to adhere to. And then we we had a quick conversation about gender accountability and some tips that people can use specifically about leading mixed gender units. And you gave a great vignette about a story about how you had dealt with some personal accountability as it related to somebody getting promoted. And you asked the question as the leader, who's given this NCO any feedback on the fact that she was overweight? And so for 10 years, she hadn't taken a PFT. And you said, hey, you know, I have to maintain my reputation and I expect people to be accountable, to meet the standard and be fair in the process. And that was a great vignette for leaders to use as an opportunity to think through how they would handle some leadership challenges and accountability. I then went on to to ask you the question about saying no and how hard it was. And you said, you know, there's some, some leaders have the go along to get along mentality. And what you did was you said, okay, I'm going to challenge this this was still the promotion of the young NCO or it was a senior NCO actually, sorry. And you, what you did was you researched the regulations and you figured out, Hey, here's why the standard exists. And this is why I'm challenging people to hold this woman accountable to the standards because this is why they actually exist. And you use that as your leadership platform to say no in a, a very mature way. And I thought that was, that resonated with me. We had a quick conversation about battlefield courage and moral courage. And you talked about how you, you just crush personal agendas. And you do that by asking the question, is this good for the institution or is this, and I'm using my air quotes, good for me, meaning the counterparty that you're looking at their agenda. And we talked about that. And you said that the goal there is to ask tough questions so that everything being received is in the context of making the total force. Is this in the best interest of the force and not the person? We transitioned over to some quick stories about battlefield courage and moral courage, had the quick conversation about livestock and how important it is for leaders to be planning for the implementation of moral courage in any sort of an operation and to be thinking through the impacts that not just the kinetic operation could have and having the moral courage to be planning for the inevitability of of some things going wrong that have nothing to do with the actual operation. And then we talked about fear and your, I asked you, what, what could young leaders do to think about how they'll act when, when they experience fear for the first time? And you said they need to have a key sense of awareness at all time. And you used words like valor, courage, and proper action are important for that versus having the attitude of, I don't fear anything. And, and you said that you thought that when, when there were leaders out there who didn't really fear anything, that was not really such a great thing. We had a quick conversation about familiarity in special operations community and were there any leadership examples there that could be implemented by leaders in, in the regular forces. And we, we talked about two things, which was setting the culture where you treat everyone in your command as a leader and facilitating very candid conversations were some things that were successful in the special operations community and allowed for that ability of familiarity. And while we neither one of us were advocating for a change in the regular forces with familiarity, those were two things that stuck out to me as things that any leader in any unit could implement and, and have a better and more lethal organization. We had a quick conversation about diversity and conclusion, and you talked about how it's important to have voices heard that will cover the blind spots of any organization and that we need to focus on outcomes and lethality. And then talked about how uh, mentoring junior officers was important. And you said, hey, this is all about ego on both sides of the fence. Like you've got, you've got to get rid of the ego, both with an officer that comes in and disregards the experience and technical prowess of a senior person of the team. And then how the senior enlisted person can come in and say, oh, you're just another junior officer and you don't know what you're doing and doesn't give them the opportunity to learn and grow themselves. And uh, you said, hey, we've got to check ego at the door. Uh, we need to have better listening sessions. We need to understand the culture of a, of a unit. When a new officer comes in, they need to have a listening session. Learn the culture of the unit that, or the team that they're joining. What's important to the people who are on the team? 
And what are the shortfalls of the team so that that the leadership on any team or unit can start to work on those shortfalls and make a more lethal unit? And if either person on the side of that equation has an ego, the whole thing breaks down. Great conversation about information operations and how it's really important to always be communicating the facts, always be communicating with people, not to be fooled uh, and not to become a tool in the agenda of our enemy to disrupt our goals. We talked about deception and uh, how to think so you don't become so easily influenced by the efforts in the disinformation campaign. We talked about, again, you know, using social media to look at the facts and how important it is to have unity and keep it and staying connected to your people and talking to your people with regular interactions with the junior troops and find out their concerns. We had a great conversation about suicide and, you know, how to go out and seek help and how seeking help doesn't, doesn't necessarily take you out of action. And you mentioned that the military one source was the first avenue for people to take and to reach out to your office directly if you felt like if, a, if somebody felt like it wasn't really working for them and then you told the uh, listeners a little bit more about total force fitness and how the holistic approach is created to have healthier and even more lethal men and women across all of the different services and then you said <laughs> we, we, talk, we talked about the education real quick of the new course that you're creating and you said that uh, Marine Corps Sergeant Major said strong and dumb is over. That's kind of where we wrapped up. And I'm wondering with that quick recap, well, it wasn't really a quick recap because we talked about a lot of stuff, but did that jog your memory or did that make you think that, geez, I really wish I had a chance to talk about this and give you the last word to give to young NCOs who are listening, you know, who out there someday maybe want to become the SEAC? The one thing that I would like Ooh. to add, because this term gets thrown out there very loosely about NCOs and petty officers being the backbone, but I will encourage anyone to go ahead and Google a picture of a backbone and tell me what it looks like. And it starts with a cranium and then it follows a spine. Realize that that cranium hi houses a brain. So when people talk backbone, enlisted personnel are not simply working hands. They're thinking entities that can add a lot of value to the organization. So continue to go ahead and facilitate their education to make them better warriors as we transition to strategic power competition. The other thing that I would like to tell the audience is that there's three things really that you need to go ahead and carry on through life and in your military career, and that is character, competence, and commitment. Character is simply who you are the person that you actually promote in front of others and the person that you truly are behind closed doors. Your competence is your ability to carry on with your mission, the skills, the attributes, the knowledge that you have to go ahead and be the expert and the go-to person on any particular field. And then the last thing is the commitment, that unquestionable loyalty to service, to flag, to the Constitution, to country, regardless of political affiliation, to be able to go ahead and carry out the instrument of power that we call war via military means. There's nothing more to that. It's fairly simple when you really look at it. But all that we're asking of you is to carry on with your duties as sworn upon. Don't waver from that. And if you don't know the oath of enlistment, memorize it. Live by it because it will help you navigate through a lot of treasures ground, specifically in today's environment. But I would like to tell each and every one of you listeners, new leaders, old leaders, former leaders or not, be proud of what you have done because you have served this great nation. And I am personally proud and honored to be your teammate. Thank you so much for a fascinating conversation. This has been SIAC Ramon Colon Lopez known as CZ with his teammates in the special operations community. Can you just take one last second and tell people where they can find your podcast and are there any social media outlets that they can follow along and get some words of wisdom from you on a continuing basis? Absolutely. So you can find us on the Facebook, LinkedIn, the bottom line of, of Upfront Podcast with SIAC is on Spotify, Apple, and many other platforms. And you can go to the Joint Staff webpage and find all of these resources accessible, including the Vision, the Joint Senior Enlisted Leader uh, Talking Paper, and many other publications that we have regarding a lot of the topics that we spoke about today. Well, thank you again for your time today and for be being a, a beacon of 
a personal example for everybody to follow. This has been enlightening for me, and I hope so for the listeners too. And so with that, we'll sign off uh, with SIAC Ramon Colon Lopez, is uh, CZ. You can find all of the links that he just mentioned down in the show notes below. And with that, we'll say goodbye. And again, thank you one last time for your time. Thank you, sir.